in the propulsion and fuel system integration what happens here in this the air is sucked in when the air is sucked in what happens through the compressor air will be what happens compressed by compressing the air what i am going to do it the, by compressing the air i am increasing the pressure by increasing the pressure such type of compression we know that that is called isentropic compression that is adiabatic and reversible process correct once the once the compression occurs we will send to the combustion chamber where the air and fuel gets mixes with a ratio where we will assume that the pressure remains constant correct so when the pressure is constant what happens such a process is called as a isobaric and we are doing the heat addition process so heat addition isobaric process there so once it is there when the exhaust gas what happens when the combustion occurs when the combustion occurs what happens the exhaust gases will come out and it will rotate the turbine and the gases will be thrown out so this is a process of how it happens the the process which are involved in the uh, any engine process correct in the engine the aircraft engines how them how they are operating so aircraft engines operate by compressing outside air it will compresses the outside air mixing with it with the fuel and burning the mixture and extracting energy from the resulting high pressure hot gases in the piston prop these steps are done inter uh, intermittently in the cylinders via the reciprocating pistons we have a the two stroke engines four stroke engines so that will happen uh, uh, mainly in the micro light aircraft that are called piston engines we have a inline radial v type there are the different type of piston engines what we are going to look into it in a turbine engines what happens these steps are done continuously but in three distinct part of the engine so this is gas turbine engines are separate and reciprocating engines are separate here and in the we know that in the piston engines we have that compression stroke intake stroke exhaust stroke so we have a different type of around four stroke engine or it will be two stroke engines diesel engines and we have a uh, petrol engines we have a different type of piston engines are different when you compare with a gas turbine engines okay here continuously the process occurs in a gas turbine engine the piston prop was the first form of aircraft propulsion so therefore what happened the piston prop what it is used is the first form of aircraft propulsion by the dawn of jet era the 5500 hp piston prop engine was in development today the piston props are mainly limited to the light airplanes they are called micro light airplanes we call the micro light aircrafts so there we are using up a mainly it is not goes more than 5000 feet altitude and it is having its own uh, uh, just we can use for a personal purposes or it can be hobby flying and such type of thing they are called light airplanes we will call and in some agricultural aircraft for example bus and understood so such type of aircrafts which are uh, uh, piston based aircrafts and piston prop engines have two advantages one is they are cheap and they have lowest fuel consumption so the mainly micro light aircrafts will be will get within around 1 or 2 crores so you can easily will get it complete system you can get it but it is very cheaper and uh, and the piston prop engines have two advantages they are we know that they are cheap and they have a lowest fuel consumption however they have heavy produce a lot of noise and vibration and they because of the propeller what happens they have a lot of vibration and noise will be there also the propeller losses efficiency as the velocity increases the propeller losses efficiency so because when you are increasing the higher speed it goes maximum 0.7 0.6 and 0.7 mark is the maximum so that is for a propeller based aircraft clear and turbine engine consisting of we know that they are compressor burner and a turbine so the three parts main parts compressor it compresses the air the process is called isentropic compression in a burner in a combustion burns where it is isobaric and a heat addition process turbine it rotates that is called isentropic expansion they have a three things compressor burner turbine so gas turbine engines works on the principle of breton cycle it works on the principle of breton cycle so these separately perform the three functions of the reciprocating piston in the piston engine so they are the three things the compressor burner and a turbine and compressor takes and air delivered by the inlet and compresses it many times of atmospheric pressure it may be 1 is to 60 it depends upon that how many times of the atmospheric pressure this compressed air passes to the burner where fuel is injected and mixed with the air and the resulting mixture ignited so therefore that resulting resulting mixture will be ignited or gases could be immediately expelled out the ray to provide the thrust then it will be a thrust will be produced so but the first pass through a turbine to extract through a mechanical power to drive the compressor okay so therefore it is interesting to note that one early jet power to a uh, jet engine used to separate piston engine to drive the compressor okay so therefore there are two types of compressors we know that they are centrifugal compressors and axial compressors what are the two types of compressors we have a centrifugal compressor and a axial compressors and the combustion chambers when you say the combustors we have a again can type 
annular type, cannular type. There are three types of combustors. You can make it the note of it. They are can type of combustor, annular type of combustor, can annular type of combustor. So therefore, mainly the feasible it is can annular type of a combustor. Okay. So there are two types of compressors. Two. What are those? Centrifugal and axial compressor. Centrifugal and there are two kind of compressors. You can see centrifugal compressor and and we have a axial compressor. When you look here in the figure, we'll understand about it. Piston prop, centrifugal turbojet, axial flow turbojet, and we have turbo prop, turbo fan engine, and afterburner. Afterburner, these are all the things why we use this afterburner to get a maximum rate of climb during the takeoff. So we cannot use the other engine because again, the weight, cost, everything that increases. So that to overcome that within that, short period of time, we have to get a rate of climb. So we are using a, another concept called afterburner. So when I see the afterburner and without afterburner aircrafts, the graph and I look into it, the rate of climb will be higher in afterburner and mainly afterburner will be operated only in the takeoff condition, clear? So we have to know about it. And when you look here, propulsion system and speed limits, we have here, the, you can see that around speed limits, you have in this, in this condition, when you look here, the piston prop, it will be maximum 0.5 to 0.6. Turbo prop, it will be around a little increase of 0.8 and 0.9. And prop fan, it will be nearly 1, 1 1.2. The bypass ratio, you can see that high bypass ratio, it will be nearly 0.9 to 1. And we can see that dry low bypass ratio, there will be one point, nearly 1 point 1.8, 1.9. 1 and we can see after burning low bypass turbo fan, always remember high bypass ratio and low, to low bypass ratio, where that is the ratio between the uh, the primary to the secondary core where the air it is entering that is called bypass ratio we will call the high bypass ratio mainly used for a subsonic based aircraft low bypass ratio which is the mainly used for a supersonic based aircraft clear and after burning and after burning turbojet ramjet scramjet rocket we can see that you can see that that is the the factor of design mark number with respect to the increase in sfc specific fuel consumption okay so when i look here we'll understand Rocket, scramjet, ramjet, afterburning, turbojet, afterburning, low bypass ratio, turbo fan, and dry low bypass ratio, turbo fan, high bypass ratio, turbo fan, prop fan, turbo prop, piston prop. So these are all are the different uh, uh, varieties of uh, uh, engines with respect to the Mach number and with respect to the, the increase SFC versus Mach number. And you can see these are the piston prop, and we know that it is the first part of it is we know that this is called a compressor part, and we have a and just once it is compressed, air is sucked into a diffuser, compressor, and the combustor, and turbines, and will be exhaust. Okay, so these are the parts of an combustor. It works on the principle of Brayton cycle. Please, you have to know about it. On what principle? On what? Which thermodynamic cycle it works? It works on the principle of the, at the Brayton cycle. Okay, and we come up with a concept called the engine. You can see that in this, we can see that for the turboprop engines, the outside air is accelerated by a conventional propeller. And the prop fan and unducted fan is essentially of turboprop with an advanced aerodynamics propeller capable of near sonic speeds. We have a ducted and unducted. We have prop fan and a unducted fan where the duct will not be there. Inside the case, we are not putting up the fan that is called unducted fan, we will call. And also the concept we, know, we, we are usually discussed about high bypass and the low bypass ratio. We have to understand what exactly mean the bypass ratio. The bypass ratio is the mass flow ratio of the bypass air to the air that goes to the core of the engine bypass ratio ranges from high as six as low as 0.25 they're called as that so called as a leaky turbojet is called it's called a leaky turbojet and we have a low bypass as well as the bypass that mass flow ratio what it is there according to that ratio we are going to segregate it is a low bypass or it may be a high bypass and we know that the stoichiometric ratio air and fuel mixture it is the exact quantity it's a mathematical uh, what do you call the ratio what you speak about it's called stoichiometric ratio we will call it's around 15 to 1 produces temperature for greater than capabilities known materials would therefore burn up the turbine blades okay and the lower the temperature seen by the turbine blades excess air is used currently engines are limited to a turbine temperature about 2000 to 2500 degree fahrenheit so we know that we have a turbine inlet temperature we will call turbine temperature why it is whenever the combustion where the uh, combustion occurs because there will be a higher temperature will be very high it will directly impacts on the turbine blades so that temperature will be around 2000 to 2500 degree fahrenheit so therefore at that time the materials what we are going to use for a 
uh, turbines, we should have a capability to withstand that. So therefore, we are nickel and uh, nickel alloys. We will call so so like a memory uh, understood. We have a shape memory alloys. We have a different type of uh, alloys, super alloys. We are going to use it because it should have a capability to withstand that. Otherwise, if the failure of that occurs, what happens? It will be a it will be a serious issue. So therefore, we have to understand turbine blade and also last time I given that turbine blade efficiency. How we need to look into it. So therefore, we have to understand about it. And which requires an air fuel mixture ratio about 60 to 1. So, a lot of methods are there to increase the turbine blade life estimation and uh, what all things by using a thermal barrier coatings. TBC method is the one method where we are going to increase the life of the turbine blade. So, we have to look into it where are the like uh, what are the uh, problems where it is occurring. We have to solve that clear. And the exhaust is 75% unused hot air. If the fuel is injected into the largely uncombusted hot air, it will mix and burn. Then this will raise the thrust as much as the factor of two. And it is known as after burning. You know that I told you the thrust will be raised. It will be a factor of two. So therefore, two times the, the thrust will increase. So that is the functionality of the afterburner. Mainly it is used during the takeoff condition. Please make a note of it. But mainly it is used during the takeoff. Unfortunately, after burning is inefficient in terms of fuel usage okay because fuel consumption will be very high because thrust rate is high directly proportional to the fuel consumption we have to know about it and due to high temperature produced after burning must be downstream to the turbine and also it is usually necessary to divert part of the compressor air to call to cool the walls of the afterburner and nozzles okay so therefore we have to cool it because there is a very high temperature it is giving up a higher thrust and and also we have to take the methods where the compressor air will be taken to cool the walls of the afterburner and nozzles. Otherwise, the, there will be a chances of failure of that material. So therefore, you have to take care the necessary to divert the parts of the compressor air to call and cool the walls of the afterburner and nozzles. Okay. And addition of an afterburner will approximately double the length of the turbojet and turbofan engine. It definitely, it will increase the length. And also, but uh, when you speak about it in that matter, so it will be increases the length and also duct will compress the air enough to burn as fuel is added. In this, what happens? We have another concept is called ramjet and scramjet engines. So ramjet engines mainly these engines will be operated at the above Mark three to become a competitive with a turbojet in terms of efficiency. These ramjet engines, what happens? There is no movable parts here. So ramjet engine will start when you go and put in a supersonic speed. So therefore, it will starts around one point two Mark itself. So therefore, we require another uh, another uh, in, uh, another system where it goes beyond the su in the supersonic speed, and we have to leave this engine. Then only it will start. So therefore, what happens at the time in the already the air is compressed because in the supersonic already air is compressed. So therefore, compression of the air it is not required. So when it is through a diffuser, what happens at the time the compressed air when it enters because of that it will be forms a shock waves. When the shock waves are forming, this supersonic wave m, m is greater than one it reduces to m is less than 1. So therefore, m is less than 1. At that time, what happens? m is less than 1. It reduces to the m is less than 1. So that time, it will change So therefore, we have to understand accordingly. Okay. So therefore, what happens here? And when it goes to the, when it goes to the uh, combustion chamber, what happens here? It will be at a subsonic. So where the fuel consumption, like where the mixture occurs and where the combustion occurs, and it will be a supersonic. So already where is entering, already it is compressed. So therefore, compressor is not required there. And in the combustion chamber, again, the exhaust, it will be given out. So therefore, in the turbine, in this, this is the ramjet engine. Already the compressor, or there is no compressor will be used in this. And also scramjet is nothing but a what? It is called supersonic combustion ramjet engine. It is called what? Supersonic combustion ramjet engine. It is called supersonic combustion ramjet engine. It is called supersonic combustion ramjet engine. That can be operated with the supersonic internal flow and combustion. The scramjets are largely unproven as of writing, and we are probably suitable only for operation above Mach 5 or Mach 6. Please, you have to know, understand about it only about Mach 5 and uh, Mach 6. And the selection of the type of propulsion system it is piston prop, turboprop, turbofan, turbojet, ramjet. These are the different type of engines which are available. You have to select the type of a propulsion system is usually the obvious from the design requirements and aircraft maximum speed limits are choices. So it depends upon what type of aircraft you're going to design. What is the speed of your aircraft? 
and what it, all the purposes we have to be very clear enough and aircraft maximum speed limits the choices. And in most cases, there is no reason to select the propulsion system other than the lowest on the chart of the design Mach number. And fuel consumption trends to have been shown. So the choice between the piston prop and turbo prop can depend upon the several additional factors. What are those additional factors? Turbo prop uses more fuel than a piston prop. Yes, obviously, because there will be a, the weight will be higher and the thrust rate will be higher. So therefore, obviously, the mass flow rate will be higher. The so thrust will that gives the more thrust compared to the piston prop and the fuel consumption will be higher and of the same horsepower. And but it is substantially lighter and more reliable. Also, turbo props are usually quieter. More than these reasons, turbo engines have largely replaced piston engines for most helicopters. Because we see that we have called a turbo shaft engines. Please, uh, we have to know about it. For a helicopters, we are using turbo shaft. It is turbo prop, turbo jet. All these are used for a fixed fixed engine, fixed uh, wing aircrafts. Mainly the helicopters will be used for a turbo shaft. So shaft will be produced to the hovering, then for the rotors, they're called Shakti engine, Autost. The Shakti engine, it is called for, it is used for a Rudra and Dhruv helicopters. That is Chita, 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 Chital. So these are all our turbo shaft engines. They are made up of a shaft based engine. They're called turbo shaft. Please, you have to know about it. And business twins and short range commuter airplanes, regardless of design speed, However, the piston props are substantially cheaper than will likely uh, remain the only choice for light aircraft for the long time. And jet engine integration, we can see that when you look here and we have a, we have a, when you look already, when you're speaking about uh, the already engine existed or it's called actual engine design, we will call, and we are going to uh, the existence engine is called actual and we have a rubber engine sizing is being used for the dimensions for the engine must be obtained by a scaling. So therefore, the existing, using an existing half the shelf engine, the dimensions are obtained from the manufacturer. Already, if it is existing, we'll get from the manufacturer. Understood. But here, what happens? Rubber engine sizing, you are, you are manufacturing your own engine. That a process is called as a rubber engine sizing, we will call it. It's called rubber engine. Is being used, the dimensions for the engine must be obtained by scaling from the sum nominal engine size by whatever scale factor is required to provide the desired thrust. Okay, in the major aircraft companies, designer can obtain estimated data from the hypothetical rubber engines from the engine companies. This data is presented for a nominal engine size. Okay, so I will show you here in this, we can see that a different type of, uh, and, uh, and when I look here in this, uh, we have, when, when, when I look in this figure, we'll understand in this, we can see that the L is actual, they have a L actual. And you can see that L actual it is a scale factor. SF is nothing but a scale factor to the power of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 1.1. 1 .1. L is L actual, D is D actual, W is W actual. That is what is this weight and we have a length and a diameter of it. All those statistically uh, derived these equations make initiatively sensitive, sense, 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 initiative sense and the thrust is roughly proportional to the mass flow of air used by the engine. Okay. So you can see that in this is rubber engine, the length, the diameter and the scale factor thrust required to the thrust actual. This is called as a engine sizing. It is called engine scaling. We will call it. It's called engine scaling. And we can see that in this non after burning engines and after burning engines, the whatever the dimensions, when I look into it, we have non after burning engines, W, weight, length, the diameter, specific fuel consumption, thrust cruise and specific fuel consumption during the cruise. After burning, again, we have weight, we have a length, a diameter, SFC, cruise, thrust, and we have a SFC. So we can see that what are the notations, what it is representing. We have a W is weight, T is takeoff thrust, BPR is bypass ratio, M is maximum Mach number, cruise is at 36,000 feet and a 0.9 Mach number. These are the different type of, when you look into it, these are the notations, what it represents. And when I look here and we have a different type of inlet types. So why the... Or uh, the inlets, inlets plays a very important role in the pressure recovery. Okay, we have to understand why the inlets. So we have a different type of inlets we have, and we have a different type of inlets. I will show you what are the different type of inlets we have. In this, we can see that. In this, we can see Naka flush inlet. We have a conical or a spike or a round inlet, half round inlet, quarter round inlet, which are a normal shock inlet, 2D ramp inlet. These are the different type of inlet types. So this is according to that. When I look here, they are called the inlet types. And uh, we have in the Naka flush inlet, the inlet will provide the highest 92% of the pressure recovery when operating at the mass flow of 0.5. So 
0.5 times the mass flow through the same cross-sectional area. So what happens here actually, what happens here in this, so in the pressure recovery conditions when I look into it, so whenever you are going at a supersonic speeds, supersonic speeds, so supersonic speeds, what happens here whenever it is, if suddenly it drops to a subsonic, at that time it will become a problem. So therefore to avoid that, so these are called a pressure recovery conditions we will call, pressure recovery conditions. So therefore that we are different type of NACA inlets what we are going to look into it. Okay. And we can see here in this, we have a different type of inlets. And oh, when I look here, normal shock inlet layout, and we have a capture area and engine front face, and we have a diffuser part. So these are all called, as you can see, outer lip radius and inner lip radius, correct. So we have to know about it. And we can see that in this also for supersonic, they are called subsonic. And for supersonic, we have a different type of inlets again. So just go back and look into it. What is the, the factor mainly for the pressure recovery conditions, okay? And uh, and uh, you can see that and uh, the cases when I look. So in this, uh, the case you have a uh, shock, two shock, three shock, isentropic, four shock. We have a different type of variable uh, inlet geometry, suck in or bypass doors in the diffuser section may be required to provide extra air to the engine for takeoff and get rid of excess air during the high speed operation. Okay. And uh, mixed compression inlet, and we have you can see the different type of supersonic inlets and internal and mixed and internal shocks, mixed compression, and we have four shock and five shock, and where you are going to fix your inlet location. So we can see here in this, we can see that uh, inlet applicability. So NACA flush inlet mainly it will be around 0 0.5, 0 0.6, the Mach number, and NACA flush. Okay, you can see the pitot uh, normal shock inlet, we are 1.2, 1.3 up to 1.4 and we have a 3-2 shock, 3 shock, 4 shock and a mixed compression and external compression inlets. So therefore, these are called the inlet uh, applicability. So are the different type of Mach numbers we have to look into it. So, and uh, and when I see that here, an inlet above the aft fuselage for a buried engine is used in L1011 and B727 with the inlet located at the root of the vertical tail. This arrangement, uh, this arrangement uh, is similar to the, so we can see that uh, engine exhaust to the place at the rear of the fuselage arrangements allows to the engine exhaust, okay? Depends upon where you are going to fix your inlets. You can see the different type of inlet locations. We have a nose, chin, side. You can see side part of it. Whenever you see the aircraft, you'll understand. We have a chin part of it where the inlets are located. Armpit, over fuselage, over wing, and over fuselage, tail root, wing root, wing leading edge, and under wing. Over wing, and we have a aft fuselage, correct? And we have a tail over fuselage, wing tip. These are the different type of inlet locations. So the podded engines, and uh, podded engines, and we have a uh, buried engines and buried engines. Okay. And in this uh, in this locations, we can see the capture area locations. How we are going to uh, capture a throat area of throat, and we have a area of engines. We have a a. A, a star throat divided by A star engine. According to that, we are going to A star is the area of the same flow at a sonic speed. We are speaking about a sonic speed and we have a subsonic inlet capture. And these are the things we can see for a different type of secondary air flows, nasal cooling, oil cooling, ejector nozzle, ejector nozzle air, hydraulic system cooling, environmental control system, the fighter and transport, different type of secondary air flow, what we are going to look into it. And uh, we can see here, for air capture area and also boundary layer removals. We there for the boundary layer, step diverter, boundary layer bypass, channel type, boundary layer suction. These are the different type of boundary layer removals. And we have the nozzle integrations. We have a different type of nozzles. We have a fixed convergent nozzle, variable convergent nozzle, converging iris, trans, trans, translating plug, and if ejector, converging, diverging ejector, 2D vectoring, single expansion ramp, there are the different type of nozzles. By looking at the nozzle, you have to tell what type of we are square to circle to square adopter, the different type of nozzles. What we are. And also we have a blades, the propeller integration, propeller sizing when I do it, two blade, three blade, three blade agriculture. It depends upon the what type of how many blades we are using for propeller based aircraft. According to that, what purpose it is. So therefore, we have to look into it accordingly. The propeller engine integrations, and we have a and when you see that for a further streamline of nasal, some aircraft designer use a prop extension, okay? And P39, the type of installation is used in a P39, which has a, had a piston engine behind the cockpit. It depends upon where you are going to fix it and BD5, 
correct and propeller location also so you can see that propeller location we have in the front portion they are called the tractor props and we have a beyond it is called a pusher prop you can see the fuselage at the front portion and we have it at the sideways and your pod wing and we have a tail these are all called in the front they are called as what they are called as tractor props and we have a pusher props you can see they are called a pusher prop they are based on the engine size estimation and we have a different type of piston engine installations and we have fuel system and also we have to understand in the fuel system we have a three type of fuel tanks one is a discrete bladder and the integral type of fuel tanks okay the discrete tanks are fuel containers which are separately fabricated and mounted in the aircraft via bolts and straps and discrete tanks are normally used only for a small general aviation in the home built aircraft discrete tanks are usually shaped like the uh, like the front of the airfoil and placed at the inboard wing leading edge and are placed in the fuselage directly behind the fuselage and above the pilot's feet and bladder tanks are made by stuffing the shaped rubber bag into the cavity in the structure the rubber bag is thick causing the loss of 10% of the made self sealing it is a self sealing so it depends upon the different type of uh, uh, tanks fuel tanks so therefore we have to understand this a uh, fuel tanks of simple geometry are used the tank volume can be calculated directly the wing box fuel volume can be approximated by using a tapered box shape and the for complex integral and bladder tanks the tank volume is determined using a fuel volume plot so we see the different type of plot system determinations is called a fuel volume plot we will call in discrete tank is used for actually the available internal volume can be calculated by subtracting the wall thickness from the external dimensions the rule of thumb is to assume that 85% of the volume measured to the external skin surface is usable for it integral wing tanks 92% is useful for integral integral fuselage tanks if bladder tanks are used values about 77% of the wing tanks and 83% of the fuselage tanks okay that fuel volume plots allows the estimation of the center of gravity and for each fuel tank which is centroid of the area plotted from the tank the total fuel cg is simply the weighted average of the individual tank cgs and should be close to the aircraft so it depends upon the aircraft cg okay so therefore we have to know about it these are all the things it is about the fuel system and propeller and fuel system integrations okay and uh, in this uh, this is the just we can have this